I just want it to feel like you and I are sitting in a coffee shop having a chat and that possibly somebody might be sitting at a table next to us just eavesdropping on our conversation. Hey everyone, it is the last Thursday of the month, so you know what that means. It means it's time for PCPA's Talkback series. I'm Eric Stein. I've got my interviewing shirt on and I've got my raspberry lime spindrift. So I'm ready. And folks, I am I just so unbelievably excited to talk with Carol Foreman because I have wanted to spend time just chatting with this amazing artist for over a decade. And I want to tell you a little bit about how I met Carol. Um, I was first hired to be the casting director at PCPA back in 2010. So my very first trip to Los Angeles as PCPA's casting director, I go to a place called Screenland Studios and we're casting a show called Carolina Change. And one of the first auditions that walks into the room uh, to show me their work is Carol Foreman for the role of Caroline in Carolina Change. And her audition was so incredible that when she left the room, I picked up my phone and I called the director, Patricia Troxell, and I said, I found our Caroline. Well, Carol um, then sent in a video audition of the work that I got to see her do down in Los Angeles. And it's still to this day one of the best video auditions um, I've ever seen. And I so proudly got to take that video to Patricia Troxell, to Mark Boer, and say, look at who I found. And they both, their jaws just hit the, hit the floor and were like, oh my gosh, you're right, Eric. That's our Caroline. And um, your work was so incredible in Caroline that we then got to have you back as Rose in Fences. And Caroline or Change in Fences are honestly two of the the best things that have ever been on PCPA stage and it is such an honor to get to talk with you today how are you doing wow well first of all Eric Stein that was such a gift that story <laughs> you know as an actor as a performer you go into rooms and you just do the work and you never know how it's received and you hope it's received well but to to see how married that story is into you know you really proving yourself as a casting person which is an art form in itself so um thank you i'm doing very well thank you for the gift of that story that that's oh. really inspiring and kind of got me teary-eyed so thank you for that well it's just such a it's one of those things that i just i look back on about how lucky i was that you walked into the room when you did yeah. and um and how lucky we all are um I want to just start off by saying you've got one of the coolest setups uh, for, <laughs> for a Zoom interview uh, that that I've seen. And we've been doing this series now for over a year, almost a year and a half now. Um, talk to tell us about uh, tell us about your magical place. Well, you've got there. this is my magic. I call it my time travel booth uh, because I've got to uh, experience a lot of different realities uh, during COVID and the shutdown. And I could kind of see it coming. Um, and, and indeed, voiceover work really kept me busy through the pandemic. And I had been doing some audio books for Day on Audio for a number of years. Um, of course, we couldn't go into the studios. And I've been kind of dipping my toe into voiceover work for a while. And I thought, you know, let me just make the commitment and, and do it and see what happens. And my husband helped me put this together. It's just PVC piping and moving blankets and a lot of foam. And I have, you know, it, it's not soundproof. It is what we call in the business acoustically treated. <laughs> and so the engineers seem to be happy with it. I ended up doing a, 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 a science fiction podcast that was fun. And they thought I was the engineer because I had all this cool equipment that they could see. <laughs> um, and I did something for Wondery. Um, it's a podcast where you tell the story of a famous person and you guess who the person is. So I can't tell who it is. You have to check it out on, uh, it's called Wondery. And they have a lot of lovely, lovely stories. And my dear friend, Dennis Hensley wrote that podcast. And I did like about six audiobooks here and have done all my voiceover auditions from this booth. And uh, and then in the background is my blue screen for my t self tapes. So this is half of my office dedicated to working from home, y'all. And it's not going anywhere anytime exactly. fast. You just have to adapt and be flexible. Right? I remember when I was starting out, you know, people said, oh, you do great work. It's wonderful. And it was all theater. And at the time, a lot of film, and, and it's still true today, film and TV people um, won't come to see you in theater and um, 
now there's no excuse, you know, a, a, you know, so an agent, a young assistant, agent assistant can click on your website, click on YouTube and, you know, you can have a demo reel. You can get together with your friends, use your cell phone, camera, shoot scenes together, do your own web series. You know, I'm working with a young actress now that I've been mentoring. I'm directing her web series this week. And she showed me who she was serious. She wrote 10 episodes of the first season and uh, it's, you know, 10 pages. So we have a film crew. We've got, you know, we got a approval from SAG. We've got the COVID compliance. So actors are learning how to, to be COVID officers because that's a thing now on set. We have an intimacy coordinator because that's a thing now on set. Um, and, uh, you know, we have people with equipment and, but the, the, the idea is we're still mentoring and working professionally. So it's, you know, we, it's now, I believe it's the year of, the actor entrepreneur. Oh, I love that. that yeah. Is you're no longer waiting around for that phone to ring. You're, you're no longer waiting around to, oh, when I get an agent, oh, when I get a manager, you, ha you can put profiles up on uh, LA Casting, Actors Access, which is what they use for casting. What is it now? Casting, Cast It Talent, even Backstage um, has a site. You can put up reels and that sort of thing. And now you don't even have to wait for a studio to get on a, you know, get on a pilot. You can create your own content. And I've had friends um, that are a, a young uh, woman. She played my younger sister in King Lear. She's directing films. So she's had a career um, in addition to her acting. And she directed uh, uh, shows, uh, the oh, what is the children's show with Jim Carrey? that was on television. Oh, she yeah. directed Tam, Tom Hanks. So she's directed a lot of big name people. But because and but you know, I was giving to her fundraising campaign when she was started to produce her own theater shows. So technology has changed the game, you know, the 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 gatekeepers don't have as much power. They still have a lot of power. But at least there are openings now. And um, instead of really looking outside to someone else for validation, look at who's next to you. Look at your peers, look at your classmates, look at your mentors. Um, folks, I have to just stop for a second and, and just say, you, I think you're already getting a sense that there is so much that we can talk with Carol about. Carol <laughs> is obviously an amazing actor. Um, she does theater, she does film, she does television, but she's also a director. She's also a playwright. She's also um, an amazing teacher and mentor. Um, in fact, I know after we got to do Carolina Change with you, you went back and got your master's degree, mm -hmm. even though you were already in, a, in the midst of a very successful career of film, television, theater, national tours, working with some of the best regional theaters in the country. What was it that, that made you say, you know what, I, I wanna go back into training and I, I want to, I want to, I, I want to teach. What, what was the calling there? All honesty, I had never received my degree. Mm -hmm. I was so impatient to go to LA and be an actor. And um, I learned a lot, but I, I didn't know how to organize it. And I realized I was missing a language, especially as my career was advancing. I felt like uh, there was a disconnect with me and certain practitioners who had come through academia. And it, I really wanted to do it for myself. Also, people were starting to come to me uh, for training, for coaching and that sort of thing. And, and I realized th there were some things that really landed and people could really take and advance. And then there were some other circumstances where I felt like I didn't have the tools to really uh, communicate my ideas and intentions and something that would help them, something that they could take and use. So um, I went back to really understand how to articulate what I knew and to fill up, fill in those gaps. Because sometimes, you know, coming through training and just by doing things, you internalize things, do you know? And um, if, if someone isn't getting it, I always felt like I'm not communicating it 
in a way that they can receive it. I, I take it, I guess, maybe I take it too personally sometimes, and that's just my own ego, but it is also a desire to want to help um, because I, you know, I had wonderful people helping me. And I, but I was always in class. I was always in class. I was always taking training. I was always doing a workshop. I always felt like in a production, I was running to catch up or running to keep up with things. And uh, indeed, you know, it was an accelerated program. I was able to get my, my undergraduate and master's degree through this program. Um, and they gave me, of course, a lot, you know, they saw my resume and said, why? <laughs> sure, come on in. <laughs> Can you, you know, and uh, I just really started over again. I started that whole Zen idea of beginner's mind and really wanting to have a deeper investigation. It really did give me a deeper appreciation and respect for my process. It gave me some of the most fulfilling experiences of my career. My husband and I being able to travel to Bangladesh and teach an arts program at an all women's university in Southeast Asia. Um, and um, and uh, it does the, it does come with cachet in terms of the opportunities that I've been afforded. It was it was acting, but also an emphasis on directing, which I've always wanted to investigate more and do more of. And so it gave me those opportunities. So it expanded my toolkit. I mean, any opportunity that I, I still take classes and workshops. I want to um I want to go back a little bit sure. um to 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 your early early life. I know in just uh, reading about you and and getting to know you a bit, you you traveled quite a bit as oh, yeah. a, as a young kid. You were you were born in Morocco. Why did your family travel so much? And when did you finally find yourself in one location long enough to kind of say, okay, this is where I am? Wow. Uh, Navy, military brat. Okay. We moved every two years until I was 14. Um, it was hard. I, I was also, I guess, what they call an officer's brat. My father um, uh, was one of the few African-American uh, officers in the Navy at the time. Uh, he was one of the few to be admitted as an officer. Um, so um, we, uh, I was born there when he was stationed in uh, Kenitra. And then they lived in Spain, and then we moved back east. So we lived uh, Virginia, Philadelphia, South Carolina, uh, but mostly Southern California, mostly San Diego. Um, and then we moved back again um, more permanently in 1976. And I went to junior high and high school. And um, I, 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 I was really, really shy as a kid. I spent a lot of time by myself in my room, you know, listening to the radio and writing stories or making up songs and, you know, uh, really painfully shy. But I had a good memory, I discovered. Um, I did really well in school because I discovered I had a photographic memory. Um, I've, if I looked at a picture of something, you know, like if I was reading through history or if I wrote it out um, and then the test would come you know, the question on the test would come. If I had written it out and looked at the image, it would just kind of imprint on my brain. And uh, the test would come and I'm like, oh, I know all this. And then I would just kind of regurgitate what I could see on my mind's eye. So I was put in all these gifted classes, you know, in Virginia, you know, and we would do all these experimental things and very artsy, creative stuff. And, you know, it was the seventies, you know, it was all hippies. And, uh, uh, and then I came back to Southern California. I'd been doing my education on the East Coast. And I had, I realized I had kind of covered the curriculum already. Um, so I thought, well, this will be fun. And I also, it was my brother and I experienced a lot of uh, racism growing up. So um, in Coronado Island, when I was younger, uh, I think in the third or fourth grade, the teacher wasn't giving me the same books as the other kids in the class. Uh, they were reading Tom Sawyer and she had given me Dick and Jane. So my parents had a PTA meeting and the teacher just said, they said, you know, this is the curriculum. Our, our, our daughter's reading this book. We know she's a good reader. Why do you have her reading this material? And the teacher just said, well, it's a scientific fact that blacks are athletically inclined and your daughter should not waste her time pursuing academics. So after they pulled my mother off of her, <laughs> I was immediately, my brother and I were immediately transferred to the private Catholic school, Sacred Heart, on Coronado Island um, in San Diego. And, uh, and I discovered making people laugh. Uh, I would do impressions of Bugs Bunny cartoons or something. The kids wouldn't beat me up. 
and so that kind of performing, you know, I guess kind of seeped my way into it. So flash forward to 1976, coming back to uh, high school at Sarah High School in San Diego, I walk onto campus and it had a voluntary integration pro program. So I wasn't the only black kid suddenly on campus or the black kids weren't making fun of me because of my Southern California accent, which they said made me sound white because I was ostracized by the black kids in Virginia and the white kids in, in Coronado. Suddenly, you know, we had Filipino and Latino and black and Caucasian and I thought, oh, great, no one will bother me. And um, there was a reader's theater class and a puppetry class that I signed up for. And uh, all of my teachers are all these actor hippies that, you know, taught us how, you know, I learned puppetry. I learned that form of reader's theater. Um, I was going to Shakespeare festivals. I fell in love with Shakespeare. Um, when I was 15, I was cast as Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Old Globe Theater that Eric Christmas, uh, who was a British actor at the time, was running. And uh, so... I don't know. It seems like a lot happened in high school. <laughs> I'm interested. What's your earliest theatrical memory? Like, what's your earliest memory of being in a theater and seeing something on stage? Wow. Wow. Well, my parents were not theater goers at all. <laughs> um, uh, in high school, uh, it was a, a community theater called Com theater on the hill and I think uh, was it uh, my aunt Charlie or something like that Charlie's aunt Charlie's aunt yeah. yeah I had seen and I thought oh this is really weird <laughs> I just thought it was just weird why are these people they're on stage oh it's kind of funny and so my best friend Scott and I Scott Striegel um, decided he talked me into auditioning with him for their next play which was my sister Eileen so we auditioned for the two urchins and we auditioned against our younger brothers who were up for the same roles. And my friend Scott and I both ended up getting the roles. So that was my first theatrical experience uh, was when we had moved back to um, Southern California. Uh, but earlier in that, it, my first, to me, theatrical is standing up in front of people and speaking or telling a story would have to be back in the early 70s in you know, the, one of the gifted classes I was in was creative writing assignment to write a story. And I stood up in front of the class. I think it was my first time standing up in front of people. And I could feel the whole group of people just lean forward. And I was talking about, I was painting the picture of a situation that was happening in the back of the room in a cabinet. And I remember the whole class turned to look at the cabinet. And it was the first time I felt equal to other people. It was the first time where people weren't looking at me and saying, oh, that's that black girl. It was like, oh, Carol told this really cool story and I'm so into it that I'm, I'm forgetting that I'm, I'm into the story. And there's something transcendent about that where we're going beyond our beliefs, our appearances, our judgments about people, and we're all coming together for something communal and sacred and something that connects us all. And it felt like I could feel the energy, I want to cry, I felt like I could feel the energy of all those other human beings in that same room. And I thought, oh my God, how do I, how do I keep that feeling? And I found that when I came to San Diego, when I walked on the campus of Sarah High School, and then when I walked into my first drama class, and I thought, you know, some people go to church, you know, I hope I'm not sacrilegious, y'all, but it's the place where I feel the most spiritual yeah. is in a theater space and, and with other human beings telling a story about our experiences as human beings, no matter what we look like. And that's an extraordinary to me. Do you remember the first time you saw somebody who looks like you on stage? That's a long pause. Um, well, when I saw their two performers, they weren't on stage, but they were in a variety show. And I loved variety shows in the 70s. <laughs> um, ben Vereen, and I think but it was Sammy Davis Jr., and then Ben Vereen. And when I saw Sammy Davis Jr., and this was when I was in elementary school, um, and I, the, the teacher had me reading Dick and Jane, and I went to the library and I got a book called Yes, I Can, which was a book by Sammy Davis Jr. And he talks about his life coming up through vaudeville and a performer and all and uh, the Jim Crow era performing. Um, 
and I, but I saw him perform Mr. Bojangles on the Carol Burnett show or some, or one of those shows. Yeah. And I said, I, I want to do what he does. I, I want to be him. I want to be know, him. Yeah. I love that you mentioned Ben Vereen. I, I, when I was uh, a young person just getting excited by theater, I stumbled onto a v VHS cassette tape of Ben Vereen and Pippin. Pippin! And I watched it over and over again. And, it, and I liked the whole show, but I was just so, I just couldn't take my eyes off of it. I got to sing backup for him on a cruise ship. Wow. And then I worked with him at the Broadway Theater Project in Florida. He was one of the, I was teaching there and he was the guest artist and we would sit and have, I have a story. I was directing a, a show <laughs> that uh, I had written one of the scenes for the kids and Ben wanted to come in to make comments on it. And the kids were really nervous about it. And, oh, we're not ready to show Ben Vereen. And I'm like, okay. So I, Ben comes in and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, you know, the kids aren't really ready to show. Do you mind coming back a little later? He's like, oh, sure, okay. So he leaves. Then word gets around, this rumor goes around that I threw Ben Vereen out of rehearsal. <laughs> I'm like, no, the kids just weren't ready and they were nervous. So I asked him to come back and I'm like, please don't start that rumor. <laughs> it's like, I threw Ben out of the room. He was like, no, you can't come. And <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is so fascinating. And it, and it leads me to want to talk a little bit about Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill. Um, you get sure. to portray the great Billie Holiday. Um, and w I'm fascinated by, I, I, is this something that you sought? Or is it something that came to you to get to play Billie Holiday in this, mm. in this amazing show? I had known about the show. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Deidre Henry, uh, had performed it in Burbank and, of course, Audra McDonald. And now, of course, we have uh, Audra Day, who's right. a seminal performance. So absolutely no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Um, uh, I was a little confused by the audition because... Um, uh, Michael Donovan and Richie Ferris had called me in. Uh, Renty Brown, we had come up through the same training program uh, through Los Angeles, and we'd only done one reading back in the 80s together. But I'd seen shows at the Ebony Rep, where he's artistic director. Uh, so he and Karen Desai, who's the producer, uh, artistic director at International City Theater here in Long Beach. So I had just come from an audition uh, for Gem of the Ocean at A Noise Within, and then I was driving to the Lady Day. As I was on my way there, uh, Noise Within called me and offered me a role in that show. And I said, uh, I, I, cause I love that show, August Wilson, I mean, it's, you know. So um, I said, I'm on my way to an audition. Can I have my agents call you, blah, blah, blah. And I get there and so I'm thinking, I'm gonna audition, you know, what would you like me to sing, prepare? They're like, well, just come in and sit. So we sat in the lobby of the theater and we talked for about an hour um, because I had researched and, and I had questions and there were ideas that I had. And, you know, one of the things that I felt was really important was that Billie Holiday was not a victim. If anything, she was triumphant. Um, you know, um, the circumstances that the, 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 the time that she came in, the circumstances where she had to discover and work and be in her craft, in her artistry, being a black woman, being in jazz at the time, uh, during a time politically that was very charged, that was, um, you know, still very racist policies, um, making an, the beginning of the drug war happening in this country, needing someone to, uh, needing a, a scapegoat. So all of these things, so we, we have this mythos that we've been working with of her as the victim of the drug addict. She constantly says, one thing that struck me was that she wanted help. She felt it was a medical condition. She wasn't a criminal. And she, you know, she almost stayed in Europe because she saw that they were treating, uh, they were giving addicts treatment. And she's, uh, so I wonder what might have happened had she stayed there. In any case, at the end of about an hour or so, hour and a half of talking, Ren turned to me and said, well, Carol, I'd like to offer you the role of Billie Holiday. And I thought, I mean, I really literally almost fell out of my chair because of course I'm excited. And then I'm immediately terrified because I'm thinking, how do I even begin this exploration? 
So it was thrilling and overwhelming. And uh, I like being excited. I like being a little scared. Um, I don't believe as much as I was now because of the expectations. But I knew I, I, I couldn't focus on the expectations. I had to focus on the truth of this human being. So I worked with Denise Woods, a dialect coach. I met her when I was working on uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. She was Mahershala Ali's dialect coach and we struck up a friendship on set. And, and so I reached out to her and she helped me with the voice. And then a, a dear friend of mine, Michael Scott Harris, uh, helped me with the musicality and the singing to find that placement, which was different from the speaking voice a little bit. And uh, of course, thank God, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of books, a lot of things out there uh, to support that investigation. And uh, working with Renty Brown, um, collaborating with him, he's like African-American performing royalty. He comes from at least three generations of performers. Grandmother who danced in the Cotton Club, mother who was a pianist, father who was a, a, an actor, a jazz musician. Um, Lester Young actually is related to him, who was Billie Holiday's best friend and musician that played with her. So to be able to have these discussions and to understand the style of the musicality, even in Stefan Terry, my music director, who plays Jimmy Powers, who's another character in the play, even the way that he's approaching the music stylistically, you know, we're having these discussions. And um, I, I, I couldn't have asked for a, a, a more extraordinary collaborative experience in order to honor this this woman so i feel in, incredibly grateful uh, humbled um to say if it has anything to do with me if anything it's like i just want to assemble as much as i can of the truth of the character and let her energy move through and just get out of the way and let her tell her story i feel like that's my job meryl streep said something that has stuck with me. And she says, I'm the voice of dead people speaking through me. And I feel like, you know, people don't talk about the woo woo aspect of this business as much with Carolina Change, with Rose and Fences. Those I can say are the two experiences where I felt that it was the voice of my ancestors. You know, I suddenly understood my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, my great grandmother. Um, I, I've got a little taste to step into the body of their life experience. And that to me is, is a huge honor. And I can only pray I can do it some justice. I, I'm interested in your journey as a theater actor who is also now really a major television actor. Um, mm. You know, I, I was looking at your IMDb page and Right now, you have 49 television credits uh, on your IMDb, <laughs> IMDb page, and I would imagine they're not all there yet, too, because I know you were yeah. filming something just over the weekend. Um, yeah. And, you know, you've been on shows like Good Trouble, Magnum P.I., True Detective, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend with PCPA, yeah, so Vincent, Vincent yes. Las Vegas uh, yes. third. <laughs> um, NCIS, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. My God, when you popped up on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I freaked out. I love it so much. Um, how to Get Away with Murder, Blackish, Pretty Little Liars, Law and Order. I just named ten of of the. the I mean, you do so much television work, yeah. um, and I'm just so fascinated about what that transition was like for you. Well, first of all, uh, a lot of things are out of context, as you know, in film and television. Um, so you have to know what the circumstances were before, what they are now, and where you're going to, you know, you, you have to map out that arc for yourself in the script and try to track that because sometimes there are changes even when you finish wrapping that day and you get home at night and you're like, oh, they added, oh, that many more words or, oh, that next scene is completely gone. So you have to be adaptable and adjust. Um, comfort with yourself in front of the camera. I mean, this is the relationship, you know, trusting yourself trusting that when you say something, you know, speak the truth. Um, uh, it, it is a skill. It is different from theater. You know, you're not projecting to people, of course, in the last row. It's, it's, it's as, as intimate as um, if you and I were sitting together and just having a conversation. Um, and it's, it's instead of showing it, um, I mean, it's still, you're playing action, of course, as an actor. You still have a point of view. Um, but you don't have to 
it's a different medium. It's the medium of the filmmaker. It's images. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as, as a look. And, um, and the, the, the story is really happening in the, the editing. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, well, it's this, of course, they're great actors and wonderful actors. There's a lot of beautiful stuff that happens in editing. And you, you have to trust that technical crew. I mean, it's a much longer conversation that's very simplistic. And there's a lot of exceptions to that, depending on what you're doing and stylistically. But it's learning to trust yourself and, and to be comfortable with yourself as an actor. And even if you are a stage and theater actor, you can accommodate. I mean, it's a transition you can make, you know, you will have to take on camera classes, which is what I did. Um, uh, and also it's the biggest transition was getting film, getting uh, real because theatrical agents, television and film agents aren't going to look at anything that you're doing on stage. They really need to find something in the real because that's the medium and see how comfortable you are and competent you are in front of a camera so that that's the biggest transition I, I have to ask was yes. there um can you think of a time where you were on a film or television set where you just kind of geeked out and were like I can't believe I'm here yeah I did it recently um I, I shot a couple of commercials during the lockdown and I was working with this actor um that I really like I can only remember his first name uh, he has three names. It'll come to me in a minute. And we have a spot together. It's a physician's mutual commercial. And it's done like a whole sound of music type of thing, which is where the theater thing comes in. And I loved him in Best in Show and oh. in Mighty Wind. Um, you know, he, he was part of the the, the gay couple that uh, had Michael the dogs. Higgins. Huh? Michael Higgins. Michael Higgins. Something Michael Higgins something yeah. Michael Higgins. And he says uh, something has two mommies. And, you know, th that classic line. Um, so it was like our first day of dance rehearsal because we had all the choreography and I'm like, oh God, he's so, he's so amazing, he's so amazing. And I said, I said, okay, I'm just gonna, I said, I'm just gonna say this now and geek out and fangirl out now and then I'll be professional for the rest of the time. But I loved you and I just started to go, blah, 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 blah. and he just looked at me, he goes, that is the sweetest thing <laughs> anyone has said to me. And so he, it gave him a chance to kind of tell those stories of what happened behind the scenes and how he said that whole thing was ad-libbed. And so that was, that was really fun. And yeah. uh, working with Chadwick Boseman too was um, amazing and 42, you know, you don't realize you're a part of history until it's passed, but um, he was friends with some other friends of mine. They had come through the same program together and this was his first major film and, you know, and uh, he was palling around with Harrison Ford, you know, and uh, talking about that. And but just to see a young actor just really in his prime and really relishing being in um, his artistry in the moment. And it was just wonderful to watch him on set. And I was just kind of in awe of this. I said, oh, this kid is good. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, I don't even know how to wrap up because I don't I don't want this to end. But um, well, to be continued, then that sounds great. That sounds great. And. <laughs> Folks, we're so thrilled that you tuned in t uh, today. Please, if you haven't already, grab your tickets to Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill. You don't want to miss this this amazing human being um, in front of you on stage um, getting to represent another amazing human being. So um, grab those tickets while you can. Um, it's going to be a beautiful night in Solvang. We're really excited to be back in person with you. Um, come be back with us in person. And we're so grateful that you're spending time with us virtually as well. Um, all right. We can't wait to be in the same room together. We'll see you soon. Bye.